Like the history of war, the history of pro football has shown us that strategy cannot succeed without strength. The first pros resembled raw recruits eager for combat. They lacked polish, but not spit. These flinty-eyed fighters evolved into the fierce free spirits of the 1950s. While the wild-eyed warriors who played the game were often defanged, they never lost their taste for contact. And like a popular rock and roll song of the period, pro football featured a whole lot of shaking going on. Every Sunday, the NFL offered a crunch course in a school of hard knocks where brawn was emphasized over brain. Some sought shelter behind the referee shirt tails, but the men who wore stripes on the field were no match for men who often behaved like they should have been wearing stripes off the field. I could do things on the field that I enjoy doing that I would probably be put in the pokey for if I weren't on the field. Well, not that I, you know, I'm a flat criminal, but it, it was a, a way of expressing yourself. Fighting, scratching, and kicking were common forms of self-expression. Leg whipping was one of several ploys that are outlawed today, but were acceptable during the 1950s. Grabbing the face mask was another. Defensive aces held all the cards. The ball was not whistled dead until the forward progress had stopped. Not his knee touching the ground. So they were you know, free game. It was kind of open season. If they fell down and were rolling and scratching, you know, trying to get some yardage, right, you would, they would open up on it. That was the only enjoyment linemen would ever have during the whole game. <laughs> From the 1950s to the mid-60s, the NFL was not exactly a league of gentlemen. Many players had served in World War II or Korea, and most still had plenty of fight left in them. Few surrendered easily, and it took devious methods to send them to the bench. The dictum, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, was as relevant to the NFL as it was to biblical times. I never would accept anyone hit me illegally. Now, when that happens, then you must serve justice. Um, and if you don't know how to serve justice, then you're going to get kicked around the league. You never hit the guy back. You hit him first, because invariably, the noise or commotion that it creates gets the attention of the referee. And then by the time he looks around, he's catching the other guy. The trick is to hit first, but never hit back. You got time, you got next year, next game, whatever. Like guided missiles, players carried heavy payloads, and they used their bodies to launch retaliatory strikes with devastating effect. One of the most unforgettable tackles in NFL history occurred in 1960 when Eagles linebacker Chuck Bednarik hit Giants halfback Frank Gifford. Concrete Charlie made quite an impact. Bednarik's hit on Frank was the greatest tackle I've ever seen. Uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's, I used to stay up at nights thinking about hitting a guy like that. Frank was not looking at Bednarik. He should have been looking for him because Charlie could hit, and it, something's got to give, and it was Frank. Like a cheap shot? Well, it really wasn't. I mean, Bednarik, uh, had he given me a cheap shot, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. Uh, he was he just a good, solid football player, a great football player. During the 1950s, football players had to be solid in order to remain standing in a savage world where only the strong survived. There wasn't that much dirty play. It was rough. Yeah, they were rough. They, if they could kill you, they'd kill you honestly. Okay? 
but nothing dirty. Nothing wrong with drawing a little blood here and there, you know, what the heck. And I like to think that with that approach to the game, attack, 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 I walked out totally unmarked. And I think that that record in itself, 14 years in the pros and four in college and three in high school, is second to none. I have no scratches, no marks, and nothing but a bleeding heart. I think you can coach people to be pretty good tacklers, but I don't know that you can coach people to be great hitters. I think it's an instinct and something that they're born with, that tremendous explosion they have right at the, the point of impact. The old saying is, uh, if they don't bite when they're puppies, they're not usually going to bite. And uh, I think when you get a young player and uh, a guy that comes up and uh, in high school he's a pretty good hitter or in college he's a pretty good hitter uh, comes into professional football and it just carries forward by the time they get to pro football i think the only thing you control in terms of contact teaching uh, is the emotional side of it i think if a player is a very intense guy or if the organization becomes more intense on sunday the more intense you are the more apt you are to be a heavy hitter on sunday you have to mentally make yourself ready to go out and realize that it's such a physical game that, you know, it's be better to be the, the hitter than the hitee.